Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. As we get today's event started, we would like to say a very big thank you to Arrowhive for sponsoring today's event and let you know that people want to work anywhere on any device and IT needs to enable them without drowning in complexity or compromising on security, performance, reliability, or cost. Arrowhive's mission is to simplify these enterprise access networks with a cloud-enabled, self-organizing, service-aware, identity-based infrastructure that includes innovative Wi-Fi, VPN, branch routing, and switching solutions. Thank you again, Arrowhive. All right, folks, today we are happy to bring you Matthew Gass, and he is going to talk to you about gigabit wireless networks with 802.11ac. Matthew is the Director of Product Management at Arrowhive Networks, and he is responsible for the software that powers Arrowhive's networking devices. He has been active within the Wi-Fi community, serving as the chair of both security task groups at the Wi-Fi Alliance, where he leads efforts to extend the Wi-Fi Protected Access Certification to incorporate newly developed security technologies and drive adoption of the strongest forms of security by network administrators. He is also the author of the best-selling O'Reilly Media book, 802.11ac, A Survival Guide. Folks, we're really excited to have Matthew with us today to present this webcast for you all. All righty, let's get a little housekeeping out of the way to help you get the most out of today's webcast. First, you'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Matthew. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Matthew, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure we see it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you might need to give it permission to access your account. The Twitter widget will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweets so you don't have to. And today our hashtag is VelocityConf, all one word. If you should have any trouble with the event today, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have trouble, just post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast and we will have the archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Matthew for his presentation. Hello, Matthew. Hi, Yasmina, and thank you for the introduction. As Yasmina mentioned, I've been active within the industry for longer than I'd care to admit now, and I think I'm getting to about the age where I'm going to wake up one morning and swear that that hair is not gray anymore. Um, in addition to being an author for O'Reilly, I've done a a fair amount of work within the standards bodies. As you can imagine, neither of those pays particularly well, um, especially volunteering within the standards body. That is definitely a, an unsalaried position, and that's why I have a full-time job where I'm very fortunate to be able to work on developing Wi-Fi technology over the long term. Today, we're going to talk about 802.11ac and why it goes so fast. This is the latest Wi-Fi standard. It's come out this year and really represents the future of Wi-Fi deployments. And you might want be asking yourself, what do I need to know to build an 802.11ac network? And I hope to help answer that question today. If you're thinking this is a lot like the 11N webcast I did last year, well, that's right, because now that we have, as an industry, updated to a newer, faster standard, there's new stuff to learn. So let's start off with talking about what it means to go fast. And this is something that I'm well familiar with. Um, thankfully, I have avoided getting a speeding ticket um, in quite some time. But there was one time when I was purchasing a car. And let's just say that the discussion in the car 
involves how fast the speed was and why we should slow down. And the car was very quiet, despite moving down the highway very, very fast. Nobody tell the CHP. <clears throat> the 802.11 group, like all of the IEEE standards organizations, has a well-structured process for introducing new standards. <clears throat> it starts with what's called a study group. And the study group works to create what's called a project authorization request, or PAR. <clears throat> Creating the PAR is really what kicks off developing the standard. And then there are multiple presentations, there will be votes, and there will be a, a great deal of process to develop the first version of the standard. Um, <clears throat> the standard is then validated. It goes through revisions. Uh, people who are within the task group get to vote and make comments. Um, when 802.11n was first validated, there were 12,000 comments that came back for the task group to address. 802.11ac was not quite that bad. <clears throat> as, the, <clears throat> as the draft goes through the process, it's used in many ways. Obviously, one of them is to work on building products even though the standard is not yet approved. And in the Wi-Fi industry, we've settled on a way of building products that allows us to work with pre-standard technologies because the Wi-Fi Alliance, which is an industry trade group, works to develop certification programs to ensure interoperability. And that happened with 11N, so there was an early certification program for Draft 2. There's also a certification program of the emerging 802.11ac standard that launched in June of this year. And that gives you the assurance of interoperability, even though um, the standard is not yet fully ratified. That's expected to happen at some point next year. If you want to follow along at home, you can go to the link at the bottom of the slide here and look at the official timeline for the task group. This is something that gets updated every meeting, and it was a task that was near and dear to my heart as far as communicating with the rest of the world when I was a task group chair. If you consider what's in 802.11ac, it is an evolution of what has come before it's not radically new technology. So if you look at the various transitions that we have had in terms of how people have used them, what they have done with them, and what these technologies have enabled people to do, 802.11ac is more of the same. It's not a radically new technology that dramatically changes the way that you build networks. And that's part of the reason why I chose this particular photo to illustrate this point. I have been doing a lot of reading about the American space program over the last few years because it's just cool. And that is a picture from Apollo 17, the last of the moon missions. And by that point, I won't say it was routine to go to the moon, but the final missions were definitely much more evolutionary in terms of their goals set out because we had achieved the ability to get to the moon and come back safely. We'd proven much of the technology, and the later missions were focused on things like precision landings and understanding uh, more technical points of geology. Um, it's also kind of funny for me to see something so shiny because the Apollo capsules that I've seen in museums are all scarred from the heat of reentry. Um, in any case, 802.11ac will be familiar in terms of technology to anybody who's familiar with 802.11n. It still uses MIMO. It still uses multi-carriers. So it uses the same OFDM channel. Um, and it has uh, many of the same techniques that you're familiar with from 802.11n. And really, if you want to break this down, there are really four key features that distinguish 802.11ac from what came before. The first is wider channels. So just as 802.11n added a 40 megahertz channel to uh, increase the speed over the 20 megahertz channels that had come before, 802.11ac adds 80 and 160 megahertz channels. The way that these work is not at all surprising. When you double the channel width, you get double the speed. Well, you actually get a slight um, advantage in terms of speed because you get a, a discount for buying all at once, just like you would if you were a Costco member. This does require that you have additional radio spectrum, which is something that we'll be talking about. The second big feature is called 256 qualm. 
which is a way of packing more data into the same amount of time. When 802.11 transmits data, it does so by taking your transmission, your frame, and breaking it up into a series of bits, and each of those bits is uh, transmitted at one point using what's called a symbol. And by using 256 QAM, a symbol is able to, to handle more data, and so therefore you can get more through the link. As you'll see, 256 QAM adds additional speed, but it's effective at shorter ranges and requires that the background noise in the radio link be, uh, be lower, and so you get a high signal to noise ratio. The third major feature in 802.11ac is the addition of more spatial streams. <clears throat> the, um, the standard goes all the way up to eight. Whether we will see eight is an interesting question. Um, the important thing from, for our perspective today, sitting here just at the cusp of the introduction of 802.11ac, is that we have the ability to add additional speed without going and developing a completely new standard. So if there is a, a need for it and a, a market pull, it will go ahead and <clears throat> um, we have the ability to build that based on an available standard. The final feature is um, really, it's, it's two features in one. It's transmit beamforming and something called multi-user MIMO. This is in some respect the, the driving feature behind 802.11ac and it's really big deal. Um, it's <clears throat> where we expect much of the performance to come from in the future. Unfortunately, it's not available yet. It turns out to be devilishly complex to do and it's actually so far advanced that it's not something I'll be talking about today. If you're interested in knowing more about it, uh, please let us know, and there's the possibility of doing a follow-up webinar just on what will come out in the second wave of 802.11ac products to hit the market. If you look at how these features contribute to the overall speed, I've put together this chart, and this is really a uh, a summary of what you can expect to see at a very high level. I wouldn't take these numbers to be completely accurate, um, but they, they're close to what you would expect. Um, the 802.11ac technology is rolling out in um, a couple of different waves. And so the first wave is really the, fir is, is really the wider channels and 256 QAM. It's the second wave where we might get 160 megahertz channels. That's where multi-user MIMO comes in. And so you can break this down and look at each of these features' contribution to the overall speed increase. And when you look at the, the gain that you get from the wider channels and 256 QAM, you wind up getting maybe two to three times as much speed. That's nice. Anytime you can increase something by two to three times, it's good. Uh, certainly, I would love it if I could do that with my salary. But in networking, that's really not enough to get us out of bed in the morning. Um, generally speaking, networking technologies need to deliver a 10x performance increase before it becomes really exciting. So you look at what will happen when we get some of these additional features in the future, um, especially multi-user MIMO, then that number gets up to that, that magic two-digit number and becomes much more interesting. I see that a couple of questions have come in, and uh, one question is uh, whether it's necessary to buy cards and PCs from the same vendor as the wireless access point. And part of the reason why it's so important to have an interoperability certification program is that gives us the ability to uh, build networks that are based on multiple vendors. And this is, of course, particularly important in the Wi-Fi enterprise space where um, I have made much of my recent career because the major vendors in that market do not make cards or uh, PCs. And so therefore, we depend a lot on the certification program to deliver interoperability. 
There's also um, an, an important point in here, which is that 802.11n was rushed out. Things were based on, a very, on early drafts that had some ambiguity. And as an industry, we learned our lesson from that. And we have worked much harder to deliver interoperability from day one. So I don't expect that to be a problem. So let's look at each of these features in turn. The first one is the way that the radio channel is structured. So this is a figure from the book that I've just published with O'Reilly. And it shows you how the radio channel is structured. And you can see that um, in order to get the higher throughput to go down that chart, you need to have um, additional radio spectrum. And this is something that we wind up talking a lot about with um, many prospective customers um, because it's necessary to planning a network. And we'll come back to this. Um, what you, and, and what you see is that as you make the channels wider, um, of course you need more spectrum. Um, you also don't need to have quite as many uh, carriers used for signaling. So those dips in the chart are used for the pilot carrier waves um, that are used to set up the signal, and we don't need as many of them as a, a fraction of the radio channel as you make the channel wider. There was a question that came in about whether or not we need a lot more channels. And we do need more spectrum. Spectrum is the lifeblood of um, wireless networking, and with the adoption of 802.11ac, it is even more important for us as um, to, to, to get access to additional radio spectrum. Under the current rules, we have uh, five 80 megahertz channels in the U.S. and only one 160 megahertz channel um, elsewhere. Um, the U.S. has proposed additional rules to make more spectrum available. And if you look at the actions taken by the FCC in that respect, what you'll see is that 802.11ac played a big part in their thinking and was cited multiple times by multiple commissioners. So it is um, not a joking matter when I put a picture up of the former FCC chairman and said, thank this man, because he, he definitely realized that Wi-Fi has a critical role to play in data networking throughout the world. Um, and that having more spectrum enables more innovative uses. Um, you look at our spectrum efficiency in Wi-Fi, we're much more efficient than comparable licensed technologies. <clears throat> the, um, there is talk about proposing similar rules in Europe. Um, however, uh, that, that effort is not, has not progressed as far. And even if you look at um, the fact that we have proposed rules in the U.S., it will take some time before <clears throat> um, the new spectrum is available and ready to use. This is what the available channel map looks like right now. Um, this is actually two pictures in one. Um, the, again, this is from the, the book that, just was, the, that I just published. The dark channels are channels that are available, and you see um, each narrow line is a channel width, so you have 20, 40, 80, and 160. And the gray channels are channels that are being made available um, as, we <clears throat> as, as the new rules are adopted and the spectrum is made available for um, use by um, new devices. One of the cool things about the way that 802.11ac works with um, these variable width channels is that it actually coexists all at the same time. So when you have a device shown here, for example, on channel 60, that um, is what's called the primary channel. So that's the part of the channel you're using. There's this terminology of the secondary channel, which is the half you're not using. And so this is true at each channel width. And that means that if you have an AP that's set up on channel 60, um, it will transmit 20 megahertz frames on channel 60. It will transmit 40 megahertz frames on channels 60 and 64. It will transmit 80 megahertz frames on, on four channels and 160 megahertz frames on eight channels. And one of the things that makes this really, really cool is that you get the ability to improve the efficiency of the network. And um, you can have, you don't have to pick a channel width and stick to it. The channel width can be determined on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. 
one of the ways that this might look is um, shown in uh, the, the slide that I've just pushed out to you right now. Um, and that is that um, I've set up um, two access points here and I've given them 80 megahertz of spectrum. And what you see is that they have the ability to transmit at 20 and 40 megahertz completely independent of each other. When the entire channel is free, they're allowed to, to have an 80 megahertz transmission and get through the, at the maximum data rate that they have. Um, what this means is that even if you really want to transmit at 80 megahertz, um, you can still fill in time when the other half of the channel is occupied with your own transmission. So in the language of uh, this diagram, what you would see is you'd see much more color in, for transmissions because you have the ability to treat the two halves of the 80 megahertz channel independently and have two access points cooperate on that. And in fact, there are mechanisms within the protocol to do a channel sensing, whether the channel is clear across the entire 80 megahertz and to fall back and use narrower channels if necessary. With channels concluded, let's move on to talk about QAM. So the way that I like to describe QAM without using all of the math that you could use to describe QAM is that it's a very sophisticated game of darts. Each, when you send a transmission, you're encoding both a phase change and an amplitude change at the same time. And there's a constellation that describes this. And so 64 QAM has 64 different combinations of phase shift and amplitude change. And what you do when you're transmitting is you hope to throw a dart and hit one of these points. And that, and that's how you choose to send particular data. So you, when you have 64 points, you can choose 64 different combinations of ones and zeros. There's nothing magic about 64. You can actually make it, as we do in 802.11ac, 256. Now, if you look at this and you, you imagine yourself as a dart player, which constellation would you rather try and hit? Would you rather try and hit the one on the left with 64 points or the one on the right with 256? Yes, the one on the right allows you to send more data, but <clears throat> it is significantly harder to hit each of those points. You have to be a much better tosser of darts. And um, as one of the questions that's out there points out, um, this does mean that you have to have much higher signal to noise ratio. So just like if you're in a crowded room at a cocktail party, um, you have to rise above the background noise. And if you're trying to do that while hitting the chart on the right with 256 points, then it becomes much harder to do. And so therefore, you do need a higher signal to noise ratio. And it does make these data rates sensitive to um, noise and interference within the channel. That's one of the reasons why 802.11ac is um, is uh, intended to be used within five gigahertz because the, um, there is much cleaner spectrum available. When you put all this together, <clears throat> and it's a, a common question to ask, so how fast does this go? And the trouble with these complex Wi-Fi standards is that there are now um, many combinations of the number of streams you get and the type of device you have and the channel width. And so it's possible to get to, to a very high speeds while only using a subset of the um, available channel performance. So the, the 1.3 gigabit number that you hear talked about quite a lot is actually available in this first wave of products that's using a subset of the standard. It requires three spatial streams and 80 megahertz channels and 256 qualms. So it requires the full capability of devices that are available on the market now. But that's far from the full capability of the standard, which actually goes up to about seven gigabits. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the real world performance you get, the, the, the numbers that I'm showing right now are basically the link rate. Um, there are many things that can influence the performance you get on a particular device. 
um, including what the layout of your antenna is within the device. And uh, to get to higher and higher speeds, you need to have more streams and you need to have more antenna elements, and that does make it harder to design a device. And in fact, if you look at um, devices like smartphones, they tend to have only one driven antenna and support only one spatial stream. That's partly because there are many antennas that have to coexist within that device beyond just the Wi-Fi system, um, but also because it's important to be able to save battery power. So let's shift gears a little bit, talk about um, what 802.11ac means to you. First of all, as I mentioned, it is available within the 5 gigahertz band only. And uh, there was a question that came in about the difference between channels and bands. Um, a band is a, is a collection of several channels that is used. Uh, within Wi-Fi, we have 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. Um, <clears throat> within that, that's divided up into multiple channels. And so the, the channels are individual constituents within a band. In particular, you look at where the speed comes in from 802.11ac right now, and it comes largely from the wider channels. Uh, one common question is why 802.11ac is 5 gigahertz only, and part of that is a recognition that the 2.4 gigahertz band that was used all the way back in the 802.11b days is that um, that's only 83 megahertz wide, and so therefore you need that entire band to be idle. And if you can find a spot where that is the case, chances are you'll be in a vehicle like the Apollo capsule that I showed you earlier. You really have to get very far away from anything, and you have to get away from any source of interference in the 2.4 gigahertz band. If you wanted to put together a network based on 802.11ac, um, part of what comes along with these high data rates in 256QAM is that um, the, the extremely high data rates at the top end are going to be somewhat shorter range. Um, it turns out that it requires about 5 to 7 dB more um, to do 256 QAM over the 64 QAM. And in effect, if you look at um, a Wi-Fi signal as it goes through a wall, it loses about um, 3 to 5 dB. So you're talking about needing the equivalent of not having a wall in order to, to step up to the highest data rate. And that means that, um, in effect, you're talking about something which reaches its maximum speed when it's line of sight. So you're looking at environments where there will be large numbers of devices or potentially requirements to have greater speed than is available right now um, in 802.11n, which would top out at, um, at 450 megabits um, to a single client. There's also some cost trade-offs. 802.11ac is newer technology and the APs cost more, and so therefore, um, depending on how your building is lay out, laid out and how users tend to gather, um, that you will want to, um, to uh, consider whether to do 802.11n um, in some places. So if 802.11ac is the future, um, and you want to start building a network, what does that mean for you now? So obviously the first step is to do some sort of capacity analysis because that's what's going to drive your move to 802.11ac. Um, and the, you need to think about the devices which are available. Um, so many battery powered devices won't support multiple streams. Um, they might not have a significant uplink requirement whereas um, a network that is based on very high-end devices that um, has data-heavy applications like streaming video um, will need more capacity. And <clears throat> so 802.11ac will start off as kind of a hotspot relief technology. Where do you expect people to be gathering and using the most data? So where do you need them to step in? And, and where do you need 802.11ac to relieve this? Um, this may be in areas where there are gatherings, 
Um, common examples that are often given are within a university campus where students gather like a student union. Um, within many environments there are auditoriums or conference rooms. Sometimes you'll see training areas that require very high density. And so getting started with 802.11ac might be as simple as getting started with, um, with uh, providing um, excess capacity by simply doing a replacement. Um, you do need to think about the network connection. Um, you do need to go to a gigabit if you haven't already. Right now, 802.11ac goes to 1.3 gigabits. Fortunately, in Wi-Fi, we count speed different than, um, than they do in Ethernet. So our 1.3 gigabits is both directions, and therefore the, that one gig link won't be a bottleneck. One thing that I do recommend is you pull two Ethernet cables for new installations, because that will give you the, the excess um, capacity to pull more data backhaul if you need to. The, um, so a couple of questions that I had anticipated. Um, <clears throat> one is, when does multi-user MIMO come out? And that looks like it'll come out sometime next year. Um, it's cool technology. It deserves its own webcast. If you're interested, please send a comment. Because um, there is interest in the book, um, the first um, 200 people to register and attend, so by being on the line here, you have fulfilled the key part of attending, um, will receive a copy of the book courtesy of Arrowhive. So thank you very much to my employer for sponsoring that. And if you're listening to the recording at home, there is a special discount code that you can use on O'Reilly.com, and that's good through the end of the year. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Joel Vincent. Thank you, Matthew. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joel Vincent. I'm the Director of Product Marketing for uh, for Arrowhive, and I just wanted to take a couple minutes of your time and then really uh, allow you to uh, ask more questions of Matthew, and we can uh, wrap up most of the time. But I just want to take 10 minutes and discuss you know, understanding some of those design recommendations that Matthew was talking about and uh, looking at the network, the network and understanding as AC comes out and the speed of wireless and mobility start to uh, accelerate, there is a question always of, you know, what is the back-end network going to be? So I think there was a question that came in on the gigabit Ethernet and Matthew's recommendation. But the other, the, the, I think one of the main points that we're looking at there is, you know, the network can bottleneck. So there's, there is also an evolution to how these networks are deployed, and the term cloud networking is kind of becoming in vogue. So I was doing, a, wanted to do just a quick few slides on what that means and why it's evolving. And it really boils down to um, the network uh, landscape changing with, with mobility becoming very pervasive at the speeds where it's pretty much your, your primary network, you're looking at, at uh, a time where networks were designed where everything was very static, context-based. There were cubes. Your, your design for the network on the back end was, I need three wires to that cube. <clears throat> Down here on the first level, it's going to be the finance department, um, and I know what applications they're going to use. So their context, application, location, um, who's using it is very well known in those environments, and policy was pretty much defined by where you were connecting to the network. And the interesting thing is, as these technologies evolve and uh, 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 mobility becomes more pervasive, and they're complemented by cloud-based applications that you can pretty much use on any device, um, Wi-Fi is, becomes at, at the speed that uh, it started with 11N and AC, what AC is talking about starts to become just absolutely essential for every device. And what that does to the network design is not only start to put a strain on how many wires and where do they go, um, how much is one gigabit and how much is AC going to go to beyond that, but it also creates this situation where a finance user, an HR user, um, you know, a POS system can be pretty much anywhere 
and you're, you're losing that context of location, you're losing that context of who's doing what without some way of, uh, without a, a way of getting it back in, it makes designing the network very, very complex. So cloud, cloud applications and this speed of mobility really start to um, make you ask the question, how do we leverage this and how do we ex use the existing infrastructure to really sort of create a platform so that all these devices can get on at very high speeds? How do we reintroduce context back into the equation? And that's where cloud networking really starts to come in. You start to build a layer of intelligence around your existing infrastructure at these very high gigabit speeds, and you can start to look at the identity of the login uh, of, of people using their devices and the applications that they're using and start to set policy back on a network. So the, the access layer of your network really starts to extract who's using it at what time, what applications, and you can apply policy across all those things. And again, how you're implementing that access layer, how you're implementing gigabit Wi-Fi along the edge is really going to determine how disruptive it is to your, your existing infrastructure, in especially as we approach these multi-gigabit speeds per client. So an access layer that really is independent of, of uh, and yet uh, managed by the cloud, but independent of the cloud in terms of operation, it starts to become very, very key so that you can create a, a platform for mobility around your existing infrastructure. Um, so really just five minutes on, on what that starts to look like. Um, you, you, you can actually leverage a cloud platform to deliver applications that you might need, whether it's guest management or um, network management, of course, of all the devices, uh, really simplifying the, the deployment of the, of the infrastructure itself. If it's independent of a, a device in the data center or independent of the cloud in terms of operation, you can achieve the gigabit speed at the edges without really constraining yourselves in the data center. Um, you add to that the, this idea of uh, those edge devices can start to pick up and put back into the network some of that contextual, uh, contextual understanding so you can apply network policy and quality of service policy to the network starts to become very, very essential. So you can effectively have anybody anywhere accessing the network in the same way that they used to when they were sitting at their desk in the Sunnyvale headquarters HR department, they're on a certain VLAN and you apply security policy, you can now add a context of a mobile user back into the network and apply your policy to that same user walking around with an iPad instead of sitting at a desktop 10 years ago. The next, the next level of what, what services can be accomplished, well, that's up to your access layer, but there's no reason why uh, a distributed network shouldn't be able to provide you with all the, the mobility, the layer two roaming and, and layer three roaming and everything that you'd expect uh, of a, of a Wi-Fi system, but now very simply can be deployed pervasively because of its, its cloud enablement. And then finally, uh, you, can, you can start to deploy very sophisticated uh, tools to monitor those clients so that as they move into areas, the system can start to help, help you to analyze the network. And because you're accessing a cloud application to, to do the management or to do the guest management or whatever it might be, you can administer the network wherever, wherever, it, um, wherever it resides. And that's the last point. As, as these things are deployed, and mobility and cloud applications start to take over and you start to have these gigabit speeds at the edge that everybody wants to use, you really get into a situation where the wireless LAN can pop up anywhere. And wherever it might pop up, in whatever situation you're looking at, you need to apply the same sorts of policy and quality of service and security enforcement at every point, regardless of where they are or at what speed that they're accessing the network. So there's a lot of processing of application of, of data that goes on. And in a, in a cloud networking world, it's all about the flexibility of the network and the elasticity of the power. Where can I basically light up a place with a fully secure um, enterprise grade network? So it's, it's as good in headquarters as it is in the CFO's home office because they're handling the same types of data uh, these days, regardless of their location, thanks to uh, mobility and cloud applications. Once you kind of have that system, 
you don't have to worry about data getting out. You're applying the same policy wherever people reside. There's kind of a sense of security in a world where you, you're probably one of the only IT people that understands the wireless network, or in some cases, you might be the only IT person running the whole network. Um, that cloud networking is meant to give you sort of that sense, that sense of, I got things under control, I understand speeds are increasing, I can upgrade incrementally and send out the devices and the cloud will help me bring them up. Um, there are many, many advantages to breaking that link with uh, uh, data center dependent devices and just having a, a coordinated system that the cloud takes care of. I had one slide on, on Arrowhive that I'm not even going to get into right now, but uh, because I actually want to give Matthew as much time as I can to answer the questions. But once you couple the power of this gigabit Wi-Fi with the independence and control that cloud networking gives you, you're really on your way to um, supporting clients at a whole new level. So with that, I think we'll take a look, take, start taking a few questions. Okay, so uh, looking at the questions that have come in, um, <clears throat> there are um, there have been quite a few questions about um, how um, the connection of 802.11ac to the rest of the network um, will uh, will work, um, and so there are um, advantages in terms of um, the um, number of clients that you can serve, and that's based not so much on the standard as an increase in capacity. So 802.11ac lets you build a, um, a network that supports many more devices, um, not because there is something magic in the protocol, but because you just have that much more capacity in order to, um, to serve users with. Um, there was an interesting question about 802.11ac and IPv6, and um, these are two protocols that were designed together, but um, <clears throat> it's not important, er, the, there isn't anything in 802.11ac that is specifically targeted at um, IPv6. Um, the closest that it gets is that there are a couple of features that are available um, in various pieces of the protocol that let you signal um, about um, IPv4 or IPv6, and so we all know as we design um, and write standards for 802.11 that um, we need to take into account that um, there is um, both IPv4 and IPv6. So that, that does appear as a theme, but it wasn't necessary to do um, much in the way of uh, design for 11ac regarding v6. Um, there's a question about um, how these waves break down um, and how long they're expected to be. And so the first wave is out right now. Um, the second wave of devices comes out um, next year sometime. And um, there may be additional waves beyond that. Um, the 802.11ac is a, a large specification, and so um, there are features that are very important and are out now. There are features which are either a little bit less important or very hard to do that come out next year. And then there are features that may or may not be, um, that may, may or may not ever be um, uh, implemented. And so we may get uh, more than uh, two waves. Uh, that remains to be seen. Um, there was a, there's a really cool question for all the couch potatoes out there about HDTV and um, when you talk about the capacity that 802.11ac adds, um, streaming video is an obvious application of it. Um, so if you look at the participation of various um, device manufacturers within 802.11, when um, 11n got started, we started seeing TV manufacturers participate in the specification development. And um, that has continued with 802.11ac. Um, and when you think about all of the ways that we consume TV that are not over the air broadcast, um, having a high speed networking technology um, throughout the home is a critical part of doing that going forward. Um, there was um, a note um, about the channel map that I showed. 
Um, yes, uh, whether or not that included the DFS channels, and it does. Um, some of the uh, new proposed rules also um, are intended to work with channels that are freed up by um, DFS capabilities as well. So um, the channel counts that I, I named did include DFS support. Um, <clears throat> there have been a couple of questions about the relationship between 802.11ac and 802.11n. And um, so one, um, one thing that I wanted to be clear about is that in the very short term, um, 802.11ac and 802.11n are being used together. Um, and that's because there is a large installed base of 802.11n. There are many 802.11n clients out there. Um, <clears throat> and so the initial deployment, just like with 11n, we added capacity where it was needed to networks that were based on 802.11a and g. The same thing is happening early on with 802.11ac. However, as we continue to work and drive the cost of devices down, um, I expect that to change. And when we get um, some of the newer features and higher speeds, that will enable us to, um, to, to build a pervasive 802.11ac coverage. Um, there was um, a, a neat question about whether adding spatial streams allows for more devices on a single AP. And <clears throat> the answer is um, right now that it, it allows for more devices by adding capacity. Um, in the future, with this multi-user MIMO technology, you can actually divide up the streams between multiple devices at the same time, and so therefore that does let you support um, even more devices in the future. Um, <clears throat> there was um, a question about dynamic bandwidth capabilities and whether that means channel assignments um, will be automatic or not. And I'm a big believer in automatic channel assignments. The work that your AP vendor can do um, to figure out how to select channels is going to be better than um, many site surveys that you can buy and will be done so on, and will take into account what is happening on an ongoing basis. So yes, just as uh, most large scale networks use automatic channel selection with N, I expect that will stay the same with 11AC. Um, <clears throat> there was um, a question about whether it's safe to buy before ratification. And that is um, one of the major purposes of having worked so hard to deliver a certification program, is that um, you should always look for Wi-Fi certified devices to have um, that guarantee of interoperability. What that means is that the manufacturer of that device has gone through and passed an interoperability test suite and um, works with, um, with uh, other manufacturers' devices. So let me I think, think. I think we had one that was asking, I'm sorry, I lost it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so th sorry. There is an interesting question in here about um, whether wireless LAN controllers support a mixed environment of 802.11n and 802.11ac. And um, that's not something that's in the standard. Um, that's up to your controller vendor. Um, and um, I will have to be really honest right here. I joined Aerohive three and a half years ago and haven't had to think much about controllers since that point. So um, I think that's an excellent question to direct to your controller sales representative. Yeah. Um, there is a question, will the addition of spatial streams allow more connected devices to a single access point? Um, I'll let you speak to how the standard goes, but um, those uh, for this for this uh, person, those that's usually determined actually by the access point's capability. Sometimes there are software limits for particular reasons or for, for no reason at all. Um, so you'd have to ask uh, you'd have to ask your your vendor or look at the data sheet. Um, the simultaneously connected to an AP sometimes. Uh, the standard could allow for many more than, than what the APs are actually capable of. I'll kind of let you speak to the standard aspect of that. And, and the standard aspect of it is, um, again, that the, there's the addition of capacity. Um, I'm very excited about multi-user MIMO, which has a much more, which, which gives you a really clear way of supporting multiple clients at 
the uh, at the same time. Um, so we we did talk about um, the number of connected clients. Uh, there was a question about uh, sharing of uh, radio and MIMO features like um, are used in LTE and <clears throat> Um, the cooperation between Wi-Fi and wide area technologies is an active area. Um, there's a lot of work being done there. Um, it's not at the radio level. It's about having two networks cooperate with each other. And that is as much a problem of getting the owners of the two networks to talk to each other as it is to get the two networks to talk to each other with bits. Um, there's one here directed specifically at you, in your opinion. In your expert opinion, <laughs> that's the marketing guy here. In your expert opinion, what is the best part of 802.11 AC over dial 11N? I think the best part of it is that we um, recognize the need to increase speed and that um, having wider channels gives us a roadmap to having higher speeds even when it's not possible to use all the other features. So I think of that as the foundation of higher speeds because that benefits every 802.11ac device, even some of the new smartphones that have come out with 11ac. Cool. Then there's one that's asking, we don't have N now, should we buy N or wait to buy, uh, or wait to buy AC? Um, I would assume that means going from BG then, an upgrade to a BG network? And uh, I, I think that's a very individual question. Um, you, you really have to look at, at uh, where, you'll, where you'll be deploying it, the applications that, that you're using, uh, the cost of the solution that you're looking for versus, um, versus what you're willing to spend, and then, of course, um, the, the devices that are going to be on the network. I mean, the, the, you, you could have a school that recently made a purchase of the current generation of iPads, those will obviously last that school a very, very long time, uh, and those clients are 11N. Uh, so you, you would have to decide if you wanted to buy AC, it might improve some rate and range, or you might be fine with 11N if it fits in your budget. Um, so it's really scenario dependent is probably the best answer. I don't, I don't think there is a... Uh, as far as how the standards evolve in answer to that question, other, other than kind of evaluate your applications, evaluate your client base and the growth of AC on your network or lack thereof, and then look at your own budget and uh, work with your vendor to decide um, what's the best route to go. Do you find uh, any other good ones in there? Yeah, so there was a question about power consumption and whether to, it was necessary to upgrade uh, power infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Um, 802.11ac has more capability um, that does often come at a price. Um, just as with the first wave of 802.11n, uh, the first uh, pieces that come out, or the, the first pieces of gear that come out, um, typically have been shipped, but they're not power optimized yet. Um, and one of the reasons to look at using 802.11ac as a uh, as offloading hotspot capacity is that makes it um, easier to use higher power injectors in just a few spots. Um, and whether you need to upgrade your switches depends on many things, including how old they are. Uh, one thing that we have, uh, that we've talked about with many of our customers is how old their, their power, how old their switching infrastructure is. And sometimes it's old enough that they're doing an upgrade anyway, in which case it obviously makes sense to go for the higher power option. Um, so, whether you need to, to upgrade um, power is up to, um, really up to uh, the devices that you choose as part of your evaluation. One question came through that I'll just grab really fast. Is it possible to get Arrowhive's official roadmap on 802.11ac? Um, I'm trying to, as hard as I can, uh, keep this from being an Arrowhive uh, only webinar. Um, and what I can say there, I mean, we're, we're a wireless LAN company. We have a history of innovating uh, based on the latest Wi-Fi standards. And, and uh, so as these roll out, you know, we'll be right there with our, with our partners, our customers, uh, on delivering uh, the latest and greatest. So 
as far as an official roadmap, I, I can't I can't give that to you, but um, you know our history of innovation in the Wi-Fi industry is pretty well documented, and and you can expect us to be right there with folks like Matthew, uh, not only creating the products but leading the way on how these standards are set. Um, um, so there, there's a question about combining AC and N radios in a single AP, and um, that is the way that most what are called 802.11 AC APs are dual ra are often dual radio APs. The 5 gigahertz radio is 802.11 AC. The 2.4 gigahertz radio remains 802.11 N. Um, so that's something that pretty much every uh, dual radio AP is doing. Many um, 11 AC APs need to have, um, of course, backwards compatibility to 2.4 only devices. Um, there was um, a question about when this will be widespread. We're starting to see we're starting to see volume shipments um, going on right now. Um, as far as uh, sorry, I, I'll just a quick comment on that. Um, all analyst predictions that I've seen, we generally quote Infinetics. We, we partner with Infinetics, and they're showing a shipments of the infrastructure, which usually is pretty in line with clients. Clients drive the, the infrastructure actually. Of a, a few percent of AC of, of the shipments will be AC this year. Um, something between, depending on who you ask, five and ten percent of Wi-Fi shipments uh, in terms of infrastructure. Um, so the, the clients would be a little ahead of that will be AC in 2014, and then then you start to get into the area where, depending on the analysts you talk to, it, it can be anywhere from 30 to 50 to 60 percent of shipments and in 2015 and 2016. And honestly, wave two, they're probably going to depend on that wave two that Matthew was talking about because once you start bringing in multi-user MIMO, you start to create really a step function uh, in, in, in capability over 802.11n and a lot more interest in, in the infrastructure um, uh, upgrades. So if those wave two products come in the time frame that Matthew says, then I, I'm, I'm expecting that you'd see the shipments follow what the predictions are saying, which is a little bit this year, depending on who you ask, 5 to 10 percent next year, and then again, depending on who you ask in 2016, um, anywhere from 30 to over 50 percent of infrastructure shipped will be 802.11 AC. One okay. more question. One more question, and I'm going to pick my favorite one here, which just came in. How long is it until 2.4 goes away? And the, ans the answer um, that I'd like to give is that can't come quickly enough. Unfortunately, I believe the real answer is never. Um, 2.4 still remains the baseline for everybody to use. Um, even client devices that implement 802.11ac in all its 5 gigahertz glory have the ability to switch to 2.4. Um, it's there. Um, it's available throughout the world, and we will never be able to get rid of it. Um, part of the reason why um, 802.11ac is exciting is that it helps drive people to 5 gigahertz where there is the ability to get higher speeds. And so with that, I'm afraid that has to be the last question. Um, you, um, <clears throat> thank you for listening. Um, my Twitter handle is um, up there on the screen. And um, actually, the blog is on the screen. Oh, the, now the, now uh, the blog is on the screen. I've been doing most of my uh, blogging on 802.11ac for, um, for Arrowhive, um, so you can go ahead and, and look at that. Um, and I do take questions on Twitter when I get the time. Um, and my demanding job has, allows me to have a few minutes of free time. So feel free to uh, to send questions on Twitter if I wasn't able to get to yours today. Excellent. And with that, Matthew, we are going to say a very big thank you to you for presenting an outstanding webcast for us all today, for sharing your knowledge and expertise. We would also like to say a big thank you to Joel for spending time with us and sharing his knowledge and expertise as well. Folks that attended our event today, thank you so much for joining us, for giving us your time, and for sending in all those great questions, because having those questions just adds so much more to our event, so thank you so much. We would like to let you know that compliments of Arrowhive, the first 250 people that registered and attended today will receive a free copy of Matthew's book. You will get the book in approximately two weeks. So thank you to Arrowhive for sending out those 250 books in about two weeks. 
And folks, as we close, we just want to let you know that people want to work anywhere on any device, and IT needs to enable them without drowning in complexity or compromising on security, performance, reliability, or cost. Arrowhive's mission is to simplify these enterprise access networks with a cloud-enabled, self-organizing, service-aware, identity-based infrastructure that includes innovative Wi-Fi, VPN, branch routing, and switching solutions. Thank you again, Arrowhive. Folks, this will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody.